Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 12th episode of Drive Through FM. This is for March 2018. Hope everybody is doing well. It feels very good to be back in the driver's seat, as it were, on the microphone doing a podcast. I'm feeling really good about this episode, so hopefully I don't uh, muck it up too much. Uh, a couple of things I want to mention out of the gate. Uh, if you haven't noticed on social media and on the drive through Guild on Board Game Geek, this episode is kind of paired with a giveaway for Rising Sun. As for the Rising Sun base game, and it looks like three of the expansions, the extra monsters, the extra expansion that takes up to five players, I think. Uh, so if you are interested in that, go ahead and leave a comment on the Guild uh, link. I'll put a link at the bottom of the video if you're watching this on YouTube. I'll also put it in the podcast notes as well and try to share that link around on social media. But if you go and look for, just Google drive through re review uh, BGG Guild, then you'll see it and you'll see the post there as well. And so just enter in there, just put a little comment in there and say, hey, I'd like to win that and I'll do a random.org and figure out uh, who the winner is. And then I think I'll just announce it maybe on the next podcast. So the contest will run for about a month, but definitely put a comment there. If you don't already have the game, if you're interested in it, I'll be reviewing uh, rising sun in a little bit of detail later on this episode. Uh, spoiler alert. I really enjoy it. <laughs> and then the other thing I want to mention is in the next episode, I would like to do kind of a Q and a type of thing. It's been however long since I've done anything like that on a video blog or anything. And so in I'll have a separate link for the Q&A piece. So one link for the contest and one link for the Q&A. And just drop me any question that you want there and I'll try to kind of plow through uh, as many questions as I can uh, on that link there and try to just answer any kind of questions you may have. I think I'm gonna kind of head off at least a few of those at the pass uh, with the end of podcast uh, section here. After I talk about a bunch of games, I'm gonna talk about reviewer baseball. And I'll explain that more in a minute. Uh, but some of the kind of common reviewer questions and things like what it's like to be a reviewer, that kind of stuff, uh, I'll talk about at the end of this episode. But I do have actually a question for you all. And uh, you can put just your sort of response in that same thread on the Q&A. And it's kind of a general open-ended question. And a lot of times uh, there's sort of a good discussion that happens between myself and viewers and other media folks. And, you know, sometimes we get in a good discussion about it. But when you say, hey, I'm really looking forward to you doing a review on that game, I get that quite a bit. You know, when are you going to get around to reviewing Rising Sun or Necromunda? That's one I get asked about a lot. And I'm always curious, like, what you actually mean, uh, at least from me, because I know it's going to change based on who you ask. If you ask Rodney Smith, you know, when are you going to do a review? You wouldn't ask him for a review, but when are you going to do a video? It would be a how to play video. And sometimes I think when people ask me, this is just my perception, which could be way off, they want a how to play. And sometimes I think when they ask me, they want like a minute's worth of thoughts. It's just kind of a general thumbs up, thumbs down kind of thing. And other people, I think when they ask me, they want me to spend, you know, 10, 15 minutes kind of going over uh, the review part in some detail. So I'm just kind of curious what your expectations are when you say you want to review, because I think as people kind of grow and learn about games themselves, they start to develop their own vocabulary, they kind of develop their own tastes and all that kind of stuff. So reviews are definitely not like a one size fits all uh, whatsoever. So I was just kind of curious what your general kind of first impression is, hey, I want to see Joel or whoever review this game. What are you actually expecting? What do you really want? Not even what are you expecting, like what would I really like to see? And I'm just curious, I'm not really gonna change up anything based on it, but I'm just kind of curious. So before we get into kind of talking about what I've been playing and reviewing, I just wanna mention at the end of the podcast and kind of the random section, I've kind of turned into sort of like a Joel thinks or <laughs> something like that. Uh, I'll be talking kind of a reviewer baseball. So a lot of kind of common things, like if you're interested in what reviewers kind of go through in sort of the, the nitty gritty day-to-day -day process, or if you're thinking about becoming a reviewer, like what's that like? How does it sort of affect uh, your sort of process in your daily life and your schedule and different things that kind of consider your relationships with publishers and other media people and that kind of stuff. Uh, last month, I kind of went through sort of an existential dread <laughs> kind of uh, point of view of the reviewer thing. Uh, which I got a lot of tons of great feedback on. I would thank people for that. Uh, but this is going to be a little bit more of a drier nuts and bolts kind of thing. 
uh, in terms of, you know, what it's like to kind of be in that position to kind of some of the stuff that you deal with from a sort of process level. And one quick other thing I'm going to mention, the last thing that I'll jump into games is I do try to like reply to comments mostly on YouTube and stuff like that. That's where most of my comments happen these days. Uh, and I don't get to all of them. And we had a good discussion about this. Gosh, I can't remember what triggered this in my head, but it kind of fit in with this whole topic at the end of this video. But I wanted to mention at the beginning is I don't always reply to a comment. Like if you ask me a question, I'll reply. Or if you say, hey, great review, I, I'm, sometimes I'll say thank you and sometimes I won't. And it's, it's, I get in this weird state. Oh, I remember what it was. I was listening to Chaz Marler from Paradise Paradise podcast and video. And uh, he was talking on another podcast and he mentioned he didn't want to seem insincere. And I was like, that's exactly what I goes through my head. Because somebody will say something and it feels like they don't expect me to reply. They just want to kind of drop a note or whatever, make a comment. And they're not really looking for me to reply to it. They just kind of want to let me know how they feel and move on. And I, I get that sense, but I feel like I might not actually be gauging that correctly. So sometimes I gauge it and it's like, you know what, I'm just going to leave it. I just wanted to leave a comment and I move on. But in the back of my head, it's like, I feel bad. You know, the person took time to reply to me. So I just want to say, if I haven't replied to you or something, uh, you know, I apologize. And if you were expecting me to kind of engage a little bit, if you ask me a direct question, for sure, 100% or maybe 99%, I'll reply. Uh, but I just want to kind of throw that out there, just kind of let you know. So let's talk about a little bit, a couple of games that I've been playing uh, that I've already reviewed it and stuff that are old games that I've played in the past. A lot of times I feel like these are going to be lunchtime games because it just seems to really fit with our schedule now. We've kind of shuffled up all the teams at work. I work in software. And so a lot of the folks that I played uh, games with at lunch, we were all on the same team. Some have moved on to other companies and we've kind of all like redistributed our knowledge across other teams, which happens sometimes in software. So we get to play games about three times a week now, whereas before it was about five. Uh, so two to three times a week, uh, last about the last month or so. And one thing, or two things that we've been playing a lot of. First one is Arboretum. And I reviewed this, it's no longer in print. It's coming out end of the year, maybe, I guess, maybe next year. It's a cool little card game. It's kind of like multiplayer Lost Cities, if you ever played the old Reiner Knizia game. That's about 10, 20 years old, something like that. And you build up this little sort of arboretum of trees and you're trying to match different colors and build little pads and things. It's got a real heavy hand management game. And the whole time that we're playing it, and this is now the third sort of cycle that it's come out. Uh, you know, it came out probably about the time I reviewed it and I remember it coming out again after for a week or so. And then now it's come out again for about a week, week and a half or something uh, this past month. And we kept thinking, like I kept thinking to myself, this is like the perfect game. If there could be a perfect game, I think this would be it because it's very uh, efficient in terms of the number of mechanics, which there's almost none. There's a lot of strategy. There's a lot of kind of conniving and sneaking around that you can do. There's a lot of long-term planning. There's some tactics with the cards that you draw every round. And it looks gorgeous. It's a great package. The illustrations of the trees and stuff that you build out in your sort of display area uh, look really cool. And there's a lot of different kind of approaches that you can take in terms of how you build those trees out. Uh, because you can kind of chain them together. You want them all to be kind of the same color, but you don't have to. You definitely don't want to marry yourself to a color. So it just has this kind of perfect thing and the it kind of builds to a crescendo at the end and people will reveal their hands, which kind of dictates what you can score. Definitely go check out my review or somebody else's review even on that uh, and look for that. This is one that we really came out. We're like, wow, this game is really good. We've kind of like thought always it was good, but I think now that we are into the dozens and dozens of plays of it, uh, you know, you then you really start to just you're into the game and you're playing each other. You're playing each other's tendencies, you know, more than playing the game itself. Uh, really, if I could say there's a perfect game, you know, like Kalis, I might say that's my favorite game, but it's I don't really like it for with two and five's okay, three and four maybe is perfect, and I don't even know if it's perfect, but I just I, I gravitate towards that. But this one is kind of the perfect thing. It, it achieves what it's supposed to. I mean, if you're looking at it playing like a eight hour war game and you play Arboretum, there's a problem you know, with you and your expectations and not the game. Uh, but I think for what it's doing, it's like, man, this feels perfect almost. Um, it does not really like a letdown at any moment in the game. So that's Arboretum. We've been playing a lot of that. And then another one that we've been playing uh, more recently is uh, Dwarf King. And this is a Bruno Fiduti game. Uh, it's probably my favorite game of his. It's a little trick-taking game. You've only got three suits 
and there's dwarves and knights and goblins. And the trick is, is that there is a uh, random special power card that you put into the deck and they, after you, before you deal everything to everybody. And you have like, you know, two through ace and jack, king, queen. And there'll be like some special card that does something uh, they, maybe for the person that actually gets to play it or the person that collects it in the trick maybe scores points or does something else, makes you like pass cards or something. And then you'll have one of those every round. And then you'll have a goal or like a quest it's called. And it gives you two ways to score points. So the person that gets dealt the blue five gets to pick which of the two. And you might actually score points for collecting an even number of tricks or collecting exactly one trick or collecting a uh, jacks. You might get negative four points for collecting jacks or positive four points for collecting jacks. So everybody gets to look at their hand and the person with the blue five then gets to choose and then you kind of play around that goal or that quest. And this one I would say is almost perfect. Uh, you have a lot of crazy wacky things. It really kind of turns the trick taking on its ear. Uh, but the problem with it is, and it's not even really a problem, is that somebody can get so far ahead in points because you play you're supposed to play exactly seven hands of it. And so you come to the seventh round and Billy's up by 12 points and the current quest, the maximum somebody could get is five points out of it or something. So it's like, well, why play the hands? Well, you play for second place and Billy tries to play to get an even bigger lead and crush everybody's spirits that much more. That's fine. But you know, it doesn't, there's not really any drama at the end. No, sometimes there actually is. And it comes down to it. And it's really amazing when that happens. That's awesome. Uh, so just that one sort of sometimes, and I would say probably 50-50 uh, or maybe even more often than not, you have that kind of situation. Uh, but other than that, it's really fun, awesome leading up to that point. So that's kind of been the two lunch games that we've been playing a ton of uh, since the last podcast. And uh, the other thing I did, uh, I'll put a link to this uh, Twitter thread, is I got to actually kind of do a tweet battle report <laughs> of a Warhammer 40k game. And that was a lot of fun to do. We did a thousand points, uh, Death Watch versus the Gene Steeler Colts, and we used the Necromunda boards to build what's called a Zone Mortalis type of board. And what that all that means is it's kind of an indoor board. There's walls and things. You're not on a battlefield with terrain. You're kind of in corridors and things. So think of like playing uh, 40k, but more in a Space Hulk type of situations or a Death Watch Overkill type of situation a smaller force thousand points not a ton of models <laughs> well the gene stealer guy had a ton of models but um yeah so i kind of tweeted out a battle report of that took a bunch of pictures during it and stuff and that was a lot of fun um and so i highly uh, recommend that if you have necromunda and 40k throw those boards down you can build like a little four by four table uh so to speak and you just build up little corridors and stuff. And we didn't play with like any tanks or flyers or anything. It was all infantry with a couple of uh, those little sentinel, they look like ATST walker things and stuff. That was really a lot of fun. A quick game. I mean, it's easy to set up the board. You just lay out all the the boards from Necromunda and you mix it around. You can, we just played uh, one of the standard 40K scenarios in there to capture objective points and things. But I think you could have a lot of fun with it. I hope they do actually kind of uh, explore that because I know in the previous editions they've had like zone mortalis specific rules and scenarios and things that kind of lend themselves more to uh, indoor corridor types of things but i really had a, a ton of fun with that so let's take a quick break and then we'll get into some of the new game reviews Okay, let's kind of work our way up like we've been doing. And the first game I'm going to talk about is the Munchkin collectible card game. And this is coming out from Steve Jackson Games, designed by Eric Lang and Kevin Wilson. I picked up a starter box, the Warrior and the Ranger starter box, and I played it twice. And it shows some potential, actually, but I think that our experience with it was not very favorable at all. Uh, like I said, we played two games, and one of the games ended up being like a real slog, just based on the, the shuffle of the cards in the decks. It was got to the point where like we couldn't do any damage to each other over and over and over again, turn after turn after turn. And then the next game that we played, we said, okay, that seemed like it was a little bit of a raw deal with the draw, and it's starter decks, you know, whatever. So we'll play it again, and the next game was the exact opposite. It was over in like five turns, and it was like, I damage you, I damage you, I damage you, I damage you, you can't do anything, you're dead. 
And I was like, oh boy. Now, I think some of this is just because they're starter decks. They're not tuned or optimized or anything like that. Maybe I got like the worst of the starter decks. I think there's three different sets that you can get. You get like the Warrior and the Ranger and it comes with a booster pack. And then you can get like a Cleric and a, gosh, I don't know, a Cleric and a Paladin. I'm not sure what all the other ones were. I just randomly picked that one and said, let me, let me try this. It does have an interesting mechanic where you play cards in front of you and you build up weapons and stuff and ally characters in front of you. Those are more like defensive. And then you have monsters. So, you know, it's Munchkin. So you're kind of throwing monsters at your other, at your opponent. And you put them out in such a way that you can try to sort of attack with them. And then they have to use weapons and things and allies to defend against them. And then any kind of damage that gets through will do damage directly to the player, to the ranger or whatever. Uh, and then you've got like a little card that's like your avatar and you have an ability on that as well. I kind of thought that was going to be more interesting in terms of how you throw the monsters out, kind of bluffing. If you think of like magic with the timing, I'll kind of throw my weak thing at you. And then, you know, you use whatever to block that. And then I throw my big thing at you and hit you for more damage. But it turns out that it like it, the stuff kind of just kind of recycles as you kind of play through. Unless you can actually get rid of the thing and like the damage clears off. And that was a little bit disappointing, but I kind of think that if I had better tuned engineer decks, the game does seem to have some potential. So it's kind of a, I know it's not a very clear review and not a very definitive review, but that's my experience with it. I'm personally not going to get into buying boosters and stuff at all. I was just kind of curious about it because it's Munchkin, which, you know, that is what it is, but it was also a collectible card game and designed by Eric Lang and Kevin Wilson and stuff. So I was like, ah, let's try it. And it was like 12 or 15 bucks, you know, for the starter set. It was reasonable. Uh, and it comes with all the tokens and things that you need in the starter deck to kind of track uh, your income, your money, which is like your mana and all that stuff. So I don't know. I mean, I think if you had the hankering and you had a group that was interested, I'd pick up a starter and some boosters and build some decks. But just the sweetness of it was uh, a big turnoff for me. And I won't be looking into it anymore. Uh, the, card, the cards were funny and stuff. And I thought the kind of the abilities and stuff of the cards were were funny kind of juxtaposed with the art and the name it wasn't just like oh this is a silly reference um you know it had like a cool interesting kind of silly mechanic as well so i don't want to just beat up on the game uh but my experience with it was less than stellar let's say so that's uh munchkin ccg and the next game that i played um and i played a long time ago couldn't get it back to the table just kind of forgot about it silly of me and i played it now twice in the last month and that's uh, Gold West from Tasty Minstrel Games. Unfortunately, this is currently out of print, but I know that it's coming back, I think, this year. Uh, this is a kind of an Old West uh, gold uh, prospecting style theme. You put out little camps and settlements and take over territory on a board. And then it has the kind of the trick of it is it has this kind of cool, almost like a personal rondelle, Moncala kind of thing. So as you collect resources, you'll put them in a bin. And then on your turn, the only thing that you really do is you pick up all the resources that might have accumulated in a bin over a course of turns, and you trickle them up and kind of walk up your board dropping off a piece. And then any pieces that you still have left in your hand are the pieces that you can use to spend. So you get like gold, silver, and copper, and then wood and stone to spend on stuff. And the gold, silver, and copper is just spent on getting random different kind of point things. There'll be point cards that you can spend on. There'll be like a cool little area control type of thing where you kind of uh, mark off a spot and that'll give you points at the end of the game. And then there's sort of like a delivery track that you deliver gold, silver, and copper and you'll move your stagecoach up and kind of sort of be in a race to collect points along this track. And then you always want to have at least a wood or a stone to have to spend to actually put out your camps. So then after you spend all the victory point stuff, all the, you know, the steel, you know, the metals, uh, and then you spend your sort of natural resources, well, whatever, your cubes, because the, the natural resources are cubes they used to build camps and things. You'll build camps in sort of a, a way, uh, and then you can grab resources wherever you build your camp, and you'll grab that token, collect all the resources off it, figure out where you want to put it in your bin, and then you save that token of wherever you were, and then you build sort of like an influence track of the gold, the copper, and the silver and the wood and the stone as well. So you have get like kind of end game bonus points there. That's very, very abstract. 
Uh, and it's, you know, I would say thematically, it's kind of odd that you're building up influence in a particular resource, like you have the most gold influence, but it's kind of like you're staking your claim and you're getting your territory out. So it's not completely loose and it's just a little bit of a tentative thread there. Uh, but I found the game very, very cool and fun and interesting and it plays really quickly. I think the box is 45 to 60 minutes, something like that. But you can certainly play this with four players in 45 minutes. It's got a nice kind of abstract feel to it with just kind of enough theme to kind of keep me into it. And the whole th kind of Moncala thing where you pick up the bin of resources and trickle them up, that's a really cool thing because you can really get into that kind of long-term planning. You're like, okay, this card I need to buy, it's gonna cost me five gold. So I kind of wanna you know, start to accumulate gold and sort of get to the point where as I'm taking turns, yeah, I'm, I'm bringing up the cubes and the wood and the stone to get the camps out there, but I'm also being careful and planning where the gold's gonna drop. And so on my next or third or fourth turn from now, I'm just gonna grab my topmost bin, just pick up everything in there and it's right off the board. So I just spend everything that's in there. There's nothing to drop it into. And then I get a whole bunch of points then. So that whole mechanism there is really, you know, addictive and fun and quick and easy to explain. And I played it with the uh, two, three, and three. I haven't had a chance to actually play it with four yet, but I think it'll play fine. It plays great with two, it plays great with three. You kind of reduce the size of the board when you play with two. Uh, and the board is all modular in these different hexes and things, so the layout's gonna be different. Uh, but it's got a nice kind of abstract back and forth uh, type of quality. And so when this does come out again, I definitely recommend folks uh, take a look at it and see if this would be something. It's almost borderline a filler but it's a good meaty chunky filler. So I kind of like stuff like that sometimes. So that is Gold West from Tasty Minstrel, but don't go out and you know pay a bunch of money for it because I think I saw it for like a hundred bucks on Amazon or something randomly. And uh, just wait for it to come back in print because it is on its way. Now the next game I got to play is uh, Spirit Island. This is from Greater Than Games from their Nexus line. Uh, this is a really cool different game. It's a co-op. And the idea is that each player is kind of a different spirit that inhabits this spirit island. Now, there are some, you know, native inhabitants that are there that are sort of loosely aware of you and your spirituality and your presence. And then there are sort of like settlers and colonists that are coming to sort of take over the island. And you don't want them to do that because they're going to sort of, you know, use up the resources and kind of overall kind of just corrupt and degrade uh, the island as colonists are one to do and you're trying to thwart that and so that's a kind of an interesting theme it's kind of like settlers in Catan in reverse I think I saw somebody say um, and so the idea is though is that you have all these cool special abilities and things and then you get these cards that you can then play on your turn it's an interesting kind of dynamic so you will play uh, on your turn a fast card so some cards are fast and some cards are slow so everybody plays their fast cards and you can play a certain number of cards and that's going to go up during the course of the game, as you sort of expand your presence, you'll kind of pull these discs off your board. That'll increase the number of cards that you can play and increase kind of like your mana or your energy that you can use to play the cards. So you're trying to kind of move out and spread out on this board and then, you know, play these fast cards. And then the kind of the game will take its turn and it will activate uh, these invaders and move them and build. And then they might actually kind of sort of attack and, and sort of try to settle and, and plunder that land and affect you and then afterwards you can play uh, fast card or excuse me slow cards so you kind of have to wait for those and think about how the game is going to react and then maybe have some cards in, inside to uh, respond to that so it's just a real simple game in terms of you know play some cards and then wait for the game to kind of do its thing and it's going to hurt you and beat you back and then you play some cards at the end and then kind of resolve that now as you play the cards you can't play them again until you have an action to actually uh, recover that. Because at the beginning of each round, you can kind of take an action to either put like one of your discs out or whatever. And one of those actions can be uh, to actually pick the cards back up into your hand. But then that maybe doesn't let you play that many cards. So each spirit, though all those actions and things are different, they have each have a special unique action that they can do. Like one of the spirits lets you uh, pick a player and then you can actually you know, let them play cards that are slow as if they were fast and so on. So there's a lot of different things like that. This is a really engaging, very thinky, a little bit AP prone uh, co-op. And the pieces and stuff are gorgeous. They look great. Um, very different, unique kind of thing. 
I think if you like heavy Euros or something like that, you know, you're more into a heavy st style of game, not too much into co-ops, I think this Spirit Island would be something that you might find fun. Because uh, there is a lot of thinking and planning and discussion and like that. I, I would say I would not want to play this with four players just because of the amount of options and things. Uh, it seems like it would be a little bit overwhelming. Uh, but I did have somebody tell me that they've played it with four players. And it wasn't that bad because the board size actually grows uh, based on the number of players. So if you can all kind of focus on your own little section of the board at the beginning, and then as it kind of you know moves along, then you start to have some more of the discussion. So the AP side of it, which there definitely is, uh, won't be as horrendous with four players, at least early in the game. Uh, the other little piece of AP, which is a really neat part of the game though, is you'll have one of those special actions you can take at the start of your turn is to actually kind of draft some more cards. So you take that action, you draw four cards out of one of these different decks because there's two kind of styles of cards in addition to being slow and fast. Some are very cheap and not as powerful, but some are very expensive to play and more powerful. So you have to kind of pick and choose in terms of how much sort of mana income you're, you're having and what you kind of plan to do. So you'll draw cards from one of those decks and then you'll choose one of those cards to keep and then you have to burn one and throw one away. So your hand size is always gonna stay uh, basically the same throughout the course of the game. Uh, but that whole process of picking the card, choosing which one to get rid of, because after a while you're gonna have really good cards and then you're trying to say, okay, I got these four cards, which one is the best one to take? Uh, and then they, each of the cards actually has these little elemental symbols on them. And so when you play them, in addition to whatever the action is to, you know, fight back invaders or whatever, then you're also going to try to chain together these little different symbols because each character spirit has a different ability that's going to trigger off of those symbols. So you're trying to think, oh, okay, well, now this gives me the little yellow sun. And I know my guy has a lot of those on his board. So do I want to keep this one? Yeah, the ability is not that great. It's okay, but this other one, this other ability is really good, but it doesn't help me with the symbols, you know, back and forth. So that little piece of it, lots of AP there, or at least the potential for it. Now, I don't think it's to the point where I would say, I don't know, AP doesn't usually bother me in general. Like, it's just, okay, that's kind of fun. Like, I'm sitting there thinking, and this is tough. So this is why I'm playing this game, because it's given me this diversion to go in and kind of sink my teeth into, and what would I do? And, I'm, you know, puts me in, in the role. So anyway, just to kind of sum up, it's an excellent game, lots of chunky decisions, and uh, but just be warned that you're going to have a good amount of AP, especially as you're learning the game. So that's uh, Spirit Island. Uh, definitely take a look at that one. I think that one sold through its print run. It should be coming out right about now, or it might have just come out. Uh, but it's going to be coming out real soon again uh, in a wider distribution, if it didn't already just do that. So we got two more games. The next one I'm going to talk about is Rising Sun. And this is, again, one that we're doing a giveaway for. So if you're interested in the giveaway and you're curious about the game, definitely take a listen now. And I am going to caveat here. Uh, there's a guy, Grant Rodiak. He designed Cry Havoc and Farmageddon and a couple other games. He actually put together a very, very good write-up. Now, he's not a reviewer. He's a designer. Uh, but he kind of talks a lot about the game and the design and why it impressed him so much. He posted on Twitter the other day from reading this. So I, I took a link, a look at the link and read the blog post. And I was like, oh, well, this is pretty much, I'm going to steal this and just say everything in this <laughs> because it was really cool, uh, really smart. And I thought I agreed with, I think, just about everything that he said about the design. Uh, so I'll put a link there. Go read that for sure. That should give you a good sense of why, um, why I think the game is so brilliant and why I think Grant thinks it's so brilliant. And I think maybe a lot of other people will too. Uh, my general impression of it is, is okay, so it's going to get compared to Blood Rage, I think, quite a bit. And I think maybe somewhat fairly, it's kind of an area control game with lots of monsters that give you special abilities and stuff. And the kind of trick of the game is to control areas and score victory points, you know, over the course of the game. Uh, there is a little bit of a kind of a low key ability, if you're familiar with Blood Rage, where sometimes you want your soldiers to die to get extra points. So that's kind of an interesting uh, little bit there. They kind of tie that in thematically with Rising Sun, with uh, Seppuku, which is, you know, basically the soldiers committing suicide, which it's terrible, but uh, it's kind of a factual thing. I'm not like an expert on uh, this time period, but I read a lot of, this sounds terrible, I know. I read a lot of um, uh, Lone Wolf and Cub, which is written by folks that did actually do a lot of research into this time period. And this is a very common thing where 
um, some samurai or ronin or ninjutsu and those type of folks, uh, they would sometimes do this where they would actually, uh, instead of fighting, they would just give up and they would, uh, you know, commit seppuku and kill themselves with a sword. Uh, so this is kind of built into that. I know there's a lot more detail I can go into. That's a pretty heavy weighty thing, but I want to back off that a little bit. Um, so that's an interesting mechanic and dynamic in the game in terms of how, you know, how you think your forces are going to do. Maybe it's better you kind of bow out and kind of take it on the chin instead of, you know, putting in uh, more resources towards actually trying to win the battle. So it has those kind of things in common with uh, Blood Rage. Uh, you know, the area control, the special monsters, the low key versus the seppuku kind of thing. But this is more along the lines of like a Game of Thrones board game, even kind of leaning towards diplomacy, although it probably doesn't go that far in terms of the uh, alliances and the alliance breaking. Uh, it has a cool action selection thing that really kind of reminds me of, well, it, it it's like an updated Game of Thrones. So Game of Thrones, what you would do, everybody would put these little action tokens down, face down, and then you'd all reveal them and say, oh, you're going to attack here, you're defending there, you're kind of gathering resources here. But you can kind of just see where people are placing tokens and then you reveal and go, okay, I kind of expected you were doing that. Now this is different. This is almost like a Puerto Rico drafting action thing. So whoever's turn it is draws four action tiles, looks at them and picks one of the actions and then everybody does them. Now the person that picked them, or excuse me, picked the action and whoever they may be allied with, because you can be allied with at least or at most one other person during the course of a round, you and them, they'll both get a bonus on that. So maybe you're doing something where you're you're recruiting and buying one of these cards, which maybe gives you a monster or a special ability, then you get to do it cheaper. Or if you get to recruit at your different strongholds on the board, then you get to put out an extra guy and stuff like that. And so you and your ally will get to do that. Um, but you have just those four actions to choose from, but it's usually still a pretty interesting choice. And you kind of try to time those actions in a sense in a way that's going to benefit you only and maybe your ally even though you don't really want to benefit them because you you win the game alone there's no winning together it's not like dune or something where you can actually win uh, as allies uh, but it's kind of interesting because there's a ally sort of discussion phase at the beginning of each of the three rounds and you're like yeah you know me and you we sh we're really going to work together we're going to want to choose these kind of actions together so let's ally. So sometimes it seemed to me like there would be an, sort of an obvious pairing of allies. And then in a four player game, the other two might say, oh, okay, well, we might as ally because they're allied. So we can't just be alone. Um, but like in a three player game, you're going to get two allies and then you get the guy all by himself, which is in the end of the world because when he's doing the role, then he's going to get all the bonus and just he's going to get the bonus instead of somebody else. So that whole dynamic there around the action choosing and all that stuff uh, is really, really neat. And then I think the other sort of main feature that I like about it is that you'll have these sort of turns where, you know, you're taking the actions, I draw four, choose one, pass the deck to you, you draw four, choose one, around and around. And then you'll have these little uh, sort of temples at the top that'll activate every couple of rounds, give you little bonuses and things that kind of change things up. And then you'll have uh, the battle phase. And before the round even starts, you're gonna mark and you're gonna randomly draw these tiles that are gonna tell you which areas there's actually gonna be a fight in. So there may not be a fight in every single area. So you know that, okay, well, that one's gonna be kind of left alone. I've got it for this round, and, but it's not gonna score anything. So people will just kind of leave it alone, but you can kind of move maybe a guy over there, you know, planning for the next round, that kind of stuff. But then you can kind of see the order in which the fights are gonna happen. And that's gonna be a huge influence on how you sort of plan out the whole round and how you have to go about collecting money and resources to use in those battles and how you're going to make that last through, you know, the course of, depending on the number of players, like six, seven, eight different fights. So the first fight, you know, maybe you're not involved in that one. Okay. So Billy and Francesca fight, they have some money to spend and they're going to spend the money. They're going to put these little uh, coins on these different kind of phases to maybe take hostages, hire Ronin to kind of throw out there to commit seppuku, uh, you know, commit extra, coins to actually get points for you know folks actually dying in the battle and so you're gonna have to sort of spread those out and then each person's going to win each of those different phases depending on who put more coins there well you're going to spend all those coins except 
the winner of the battle who actually wins you know what actually happens on in the area is going to give their coins to the other players that they were in con uh, contesting the area with they're going to split them up between them or if it was just one other player they get all the coins so now you've got more coins coming in and then there's a whole dynamic there it's like okay are they just trying to milk me for coins for the fourth battle that's down the line so they can really win that am i involved in that do i want them to win that maybe i'm not even involved in that area but i know if they win that that's going to be huge for them because each battle that you win is going to give you a token of a certain color depending on the region you're going to get a lot of bonus points for having different colored uh tokens for the different regions so you're going to score points yeah during the battle it's going to go up over the course of the game but then you have the kind of end game little bonus there that's going to happen and all the monsters and cards and abilities and effects are, are going to affect all that and you're going to get bonus points and stuff sometimes bonus points for committing seppuku and things like that so all that you're going to have to kind of number crunch and keep in mind and you know plan out in terms of how you, how involved you're going to get so that whole theme of the game of kind of fainting and bluffing and am i really going after this am i really involved here do i need this am i setting myself up so that i'm in a position that i have to get this you know that kind of thing all that kind of devi deviousness uh really comes out uh, in the game. And so it's a really fun kind of, you know, kind of this 2.0, I think of Game of Thrones board game of diplomacy and that kind of stuff. So it's a very, very different feel to Blood Rage. Although I, like I said, it does have a lot in common. It's got that kind of really smart, elegant, I hate using that word, I'm sorry, but it is elegant area control and kind of the whole scheming and, and moving around of your guys and the monsters and, and kind of really planning that last minute sort of you know attack and moving in your forces into a certain area that everybody's like oh no now he's gonna totally gonna get that and we didn't see that coming or whatever so it has that in common but it's definitely more uh, on on the uh, i don't know on that negotiation sort of it feels more backstabby uh than than blood rage but it's not like you you know it's not like you don't expect it like you you expect to get backstabbed you expect for things to kind of come up out of nowhere and have somebody just kind of overwhelm you or sneak in and spend that one extra resource that you didn't think they would spend uh, and that kind of stuff so I definitely recommend this game I mean this is a game we've had just a ton of fun with and that is Rising Sun from Cool Mini or Not or Simon Inc I should say and uh, definitely if you're interested in this I highly recommend it you'll get the you know the base game and the monster pack and some other uh different uh, tokens and extra factions and things that you can use and uh but i would say just the base game honestly if you're thinking about going out and buying it if you just get the base game which is all i've played with i haven't actually dipped into the other stuff there's a ton of stuff in the base game you don't need need, need all that other cool stuff all, all that other stuff seems cool and worth getting just you know an, an impression uh but you don't need it i don't think i think you can get a ton of plays out of just the base game and you'll have a lot of fun so that is rising sun now we have one more game to review and this has been the surprise kind of hit of the last month and this is from a company called awaken realms i think this is their first or second game and it's called lords of hellas now this is a different kind of area control game it's a different kind of theme uh, and i would say it's actually more of a dudes on the map style game but that's very very unique uh, for that style of game. Now, uh, the first unique thing to talk about is the theme. And it's set in kind of a futuristic ancient Greece. <laughs> so you have ancient Greek gods like Zeus and Athena and so on, and different monsters like the Cerebus, uh, the Minotaur, and the Cyclops, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's all kind of futuristic and space age looking, which is really weird, but it actually is kind of cool. Uh, but I think at its heart, this game sort of feels like a fantasy civilization game because you're trying to do a lot of different things. You're trying to sort of expand territory, control different temples and things, but you're also trying to go on quests and slay monsters and sort of control uh, these big monuments and things. So it has kind of a civ feel, a very, very light, uh, a lot, kind of a dudes on the map feel where you're moving armies around and things, but then you, each of you has a hero that you're going to sort of like your avatar and you can send them to slay monsters to kind of help your army and do different things based on their different special abilities and also go on quests, which is going to help you get extra bonuses and things. Now, I think the main takeaway for me in this game, and this is something that this is why I think this is my favorite game of the month so far, uh, is this part. <laughs> so it has four victory conditions. And once one player meets any of those four, the game's over, it's done. That's it. So what are the victory conditions? Well, one is to control two lands. 
So a land is made up of several regions. So it's kind of like, think of it like a continent. It's not that big, but it's just a large area of land. So you, once you control two of those, bam, you win. The next one is if you control five regions, those are the little areas, with temples, you win. So once you get five of those, you win. That's probably the hardest one to do, I think. Uh, the next one is killing three monsters. Once you kill three monsters, bam, you win. And then the last one is if you control an area where a monument is built. And it has these huge giant miniatures that actually come in pieces. You're not supposed to put them together, but as you build them, uh, the base game comes with three monuments. Then you'll take actions to build them. And then once a monument is fully built, then a little trigger timer will happen. And at the end of three turns after that has been built, whoever controls just that one region is going to win the game. So they control like the monument to Zeus, Athena, or Hermes. And that's, that's it. So in that, it's kind of like baked in this end game. So you, you know, people are going to naturally sort of expand and start to take over a land and then they're going to get close to taking over two. You got to be careful and you want to beat them back. So there's like no way to turtle. So that kind of fights that away. So you, you have to kind of spread out and you have to do some combat. You got to get in the, in their face. Um, but then you want to try to control these temples. So when you build a temple in a region that you control, it's also going to trigger this draft. So everybody's going to draft these random blessings that you're going to deal from a deck of cards and whoever built it gets the first one. Now, not every time you build a temple is going to kind of change it on each game, but the important part is when that happens, you draft it and that gives you a new kind of unique asymmetric ability to take on the rest of the game with. It may help you with monster hunting. It may help you with combat with the troops and so on. It may give you like a bump to your hero's special attributes. So that's really neat. And then you have the monsters that are th just there and they're kind of causing havoc. They're going in and like killing all your little troops and soldiers and things. And, you know, maybe blocking it so that you can't actually go worship at these different monuments that are being erected. Uh, so you want to just kind of kill them anyway. Um, but then again, it's not too difficult to kill three. So that's one you got to kind of watch out for. So you're kind of forced to send your guy out to go kill monsters just so Billy over there who just killed the second monster doesn't get his third and so on. And then, of course, you have the monument thing where once you control a region with just that one monument, you win. Well, the monuments have to be built. Now, they're going to be built at different paces depending on how the game goes. So as you take your turn, you have some basic actions you can do, move some troops around, move your hero around, stuff like that. And then each player has these six special actions that you can do, and you have to pick one. And once you pick, let's say, the special action to uh, recruit new troops at a, at a, a city, then you can't do that recruit action again until one player takes the build monument action. So you're kind of blocking out these actions, like there's a march action that allows you to move even more troops than your basic move. Uh, and then the hunting of a monster, that's a special action. So if you're gonna go hunt, you block that off and you can't do that until somebody does a build monument. When somebody does a build monument, they're gonna choose one of the three monuments, tack on the extra piece, like it's gonna be their legs and then the torso and then the arms and so on. Once you do that, it's going to kind of reset everybody. Everybody's going to wipe off all the little action markers so they can take any of the special actions they want again. You're going to have priests that you can actually send to these monuments from the beginning of the game. That's going to, when you send a priest to a monument, that is going to give you bonuses, but it's always going to increase one of the stats of your hero. So the hero is going to be able to move around the board faster. They're going to be able to command more troops. They're going to be able to fight monsters better. So all those priests are going to go away. You're going to look at who controls all the temples that have been built and then the people are going to get priests equal to the temples they control and then you also get these little artifact cards from fighting monsters and stuff and those are going to also untap so artifacts you're going to get and you can tap and do cool stuff with them but they stay tapped until somebody builds a monument and when any player builds a monument it resets it for everybody so the monuments like they're just going to have to be get built uh, now, I played it twice. In the first game, the monuments were all being built pretty quickly. So that end game was approaching, approaching, approaching. And the second game, we were kind of taking our time to building the monuments, but the other parts of the game were still driving the end game forward. So you have this kind of like noose, sort of, you know, kind of choking the game in a good way, where it's like all of this stuff is happening like right from the beginning. You've got to be watching this and this and this and this. And that end game is just going to happen. You, you know, you w both games we played to this, it was like everybody was was either in contention to win like on their next turn or you know was maybe just one turn away even from there and it was whether they were going to kill the monster get that territory so it really kind of divides your attention 
and divides what you want to do. Like I want to go kill a monster, but I can't take my hunt special action uh, because maybe I just took it or I don't want to take it because I want to do the march action because if you get that last region, you're going to get the two lands. So I've got to, you know, you've got to really manage your resources and manage kind of like your little empire, which is where kind of the Civ feel front comes from. Uh, so that's a really cool kind of thing. Uh, and the game kind of just naturally seems to all kind of just plug in together, uh, you know, because of those four main conditions and the way that the special actions work, where how you can't just do whatever you want in your turn, you're kind of, you know, icing yourself out as you take actions. So that's really, really the crux of the game. Uh, the other thing is like, so when somebody builds a monument, it's, you're going to go activate all the monsters on the board and it's going to like wreak havoc and everybody's going to cry because they killed like three of the soldiers and stuff like that. But you know that because you can see the monster card on the board and you're like, okay, so there's a chance, there's a die roll, but either the monster is going to move to an adjacent region or it's going to jack me up. <laughs> so I either got to go kill the monster, which is good because it helps me, you know, towards one of the victory conditions, or I should move my troops out, or I should just, you know, be prepared to eat it and not worry about maybe moving more troops in so the hit isn't as bad and so on. Now that's kind of the gist of the game. This game mechanically, difficult to talk about. I would watch a video on it. I know uh, board game replays. Uh, got a, a playthrough of it and I think there's a instructional video coming out and all that kind of cool stuff uh, highly recommend the game though this has been the hit I kind of expected Rising Sun to be you know my number one game that, of the recent ones that I've played uh, and these two you know they're close but I got to give the slight bump there to Lords of Hellas because every time I freaking post <laughs> I'm like oh I just played Lords of Hellas be like which one do you like better Rising Sun or Lords of Hellas and I'm like give me a break <laughs> they're both good why do I have to choose one but yeah okay fine I'll choose one uh, Lords of Hellas, just because that whole four end game conditions just kind of, you know, kind of circling the drain, which is a negative image, but it's like, oh no, here we go, here we go. You know, it also really reminds me of Inish, uh, which is a game I still have and still enjoy, but this is like a really, I don't know, tricked out Inish in a way. Uh, so, it, you know, Inish has the whole card driven thing with the special cards and stuff that you can add. Um, this is a different, unique thing. But yeah, I really recommend Lords of Hellas if you're into like dudes on the map style thing. I mean, I didn't even talk about how you hunt monsters and how that kind of, uh, it, it almost fights against and integrates with in different ways using the cards that you play to fight monsters to having those combat cards also work when you have a combat between you and another player. You know, you move your troops in together, they're going to have a fight, you know, we can go back and forth playing cards. Well, those cards that you get, those combat cards, and you can get those in a variety of different ways, those are multi-use cards. So you're like, eh, I want to use this, I'll kill that monster in the next turn. Yeah, but it's got this, you know, it's going to help me with defense on the monster versus I'm going to use it in the combat, which maybe it's going to come up next round. So that whole, you know, multi-use card thing, which I'm a huge sucker for, um, that's awesome as well. So just all the way all these mechanics kind of interweave and everything to take what should be uh, complex now it's a little bit complex our first play just to kind of get into it but once man once you get in it's just really going to hum and, and sync together and it's going to play quickly i think i uh, played it uh, four player twice and uh, the first time was about three hours but we we're looking up rules and things the rule book itself everything's in there everything's fine there's just a couple of minor questions that we had that were kind of common sense but we're like eh, it's not that clear but it's common sense uh, like if you get kicked off of a quest, where do you put your character? Well, you just put it back in the area where he was. Um, there's a couple of just minor, minor things like that, but I do not like how like visually the rule book is laid out and this is how it's organized. Like the information and like, you know, the, the language is good. I think the language is clear, but just kind of the visual layout, it was just tricky. But now that I'm into it and I've played it, it's fine. I know where to go look up stuff. So it's just a little bit of a hurdle to get that first game in. That's all. But I think one, I think it's totally worth it to get in there, invest, make sure you're playing it right, check Board Game Geek. Be, I, I, all the questions that we had, and I think it was like two, maybe three, they were like, eh, let's check. They were there on Board Game Geek, so we looked it up and we were fine. Uh, no big deal. Uh, so, yeah, I highly recommend the game uh, for that. This has been a huge surprise. I mean, I did not really, frankly, know what to think of it. Um, you know, I knew the rules and stuff a little bit beforehand. I know they changed it from prior to the Kickstarter uh, you know, until now and stuff. Um, but I think they've made some good changes for it and the game is really uh, improved by it. So that's uh, Lords of Hellas. Again, high recommendation on that one. Okay, so that's all the reviews. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into the random thing. This probably won't be that long. I've kind of gone long, I think, anyway. But uh, I'll just kind of go through the nuts and bolts again. 
if you have any questions or q a type thing i'll put links to all that stuff uh but let's take a quick break you like my little transition music i don't know i gotta put some transmission in here and uh <laughs> make this a little bit more professional anyway so here's some transition music and then i'll see you after that Okay, so we're back and we're going to talk about reviewer baseball. So why did I call it reviewer baseball? I kicked around a whole bunch of names, but if you've ever heard the term inside baseball, it's kind of like just, you know, going behind the curtain a little bit, seeing a little bit of how, how the sausage is made, you know, terrible analogies like that. <laughs> uh, but I just want to kind of talk a little bit about it. Like sometimes people don't really, uh, you know, I get questions about it or that kind of thing, or it's just, you know, not really a kind of a known thing. Um, the one thing that I want to just kind of stress here is I feel like most of you are probably not going to get this giant revelation out of this because, you know, people that watch my channel and other channels are not dumb. <laughs> so if this sounds like, you know, guys, this ain't a bunch of obvious stuff to me, that's fine. But I think sometimes people are a little bit curious about, you know, maybe some of the more of these details. But anyway, that's something I'm really get hung up on sometimes. And I, I think since my first video, I've always been kind of hung up on, well, don't treat them like they're stupid. Like, you know, don't like talk down to them or, but you also don't want to be like, okay, well maybe somebody brand new to the hobby who hasn't like visited tabletop or the dice tower or whatever stumbles upon your channel first. And you know, you still want to explain things to them in a way that they haven't heard before. But again, they also aren't dumb. And so that's just something that is tricky uh, for me. Uh, you know, I just I, maybe I think I get a little hung up on on trying not to treat the viewer like they don't know what they're doing, because they know better than me <laughs> what they want and what they like. So anyway, so, so if some of this comes off like, dude, I'm not an idiot, I for, forgive me. So the one thing I want to get out of the way, and I've never actually uh, directly addressed this. I feel like I have randomly, but not like as a sort of a formality. I, there's a little blurb on my website about this. But I see this come up a lot on uh, Board Game Geek and Reddit and stuff like that and Twitter or whatever and Facebook groups. And it's about reviewers like getting paid. And it seems to sort of died down. And I think because some people got sort of irritated by that. As I know of zero reviewers that are paid by a publisher. And now I've heard people say, oh no, for sure. I know, I know reviewers that are paid by a publisher. And the couple of names that I've heard, I've either asked them directly or I've talked to other people because I didn't feel comfortable asking them directly. And it's like, no, that doesn't happen at all. And, or they've come out publicly and said, no, I don't get paid to do reviews. Now that's different than a Kickstarter preview. Kickstarter preview, I think you should charge for, and that's a whole other topic um, because you're basically building a marketing video to sell a product, not a product that was already made and produced and now you're gonna review. Anyway. That's a long discussion. I don't really care to have that. Um, I have done Kickstarter previews and I've been paid to do them. And I've been up front. I marked a little thing on the box that says this is a paid promotion. And so you know that I'm getting paid. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm lying all of a sudden magically because the money changed hands because I wouldn't do a preview of a game that I thought sucked. So there's that. But I have seen people say, oh, no, no. I know reviewers, uh, reviewers that get paid to do reviews, not previews. And I think that's 100% uh, bull pucky. <laughs> And uh, so, and I've seen that bandied about and that irritates me because it just, I don't know, it's just icky because I don't think that it happens. And, you know, anytime I've actually pushed people for proof because I've taken people aside and say, show me the proof of this. And then they come up with nothing. It's like some random email that they heard. Now I have received, I will say this, emails from publishers who you've never heard of and probably will never hear of ever. They say, hey, we want you to do a review of this game that just came out and we you know we'd like to compensate you to the review. What, what do I do? I just delete the email. A, because it's a publisher I've never heard of doing a game that looks like terrible garbage. B, because they're like offering me money and you know, I try to keep my podcast curse free. So I'm gonna keep doing that. But it's basically F you, you know, I'm deleting your email, you jerk for insinuating that. That's the only thing I've ever seen. Now, I'm sure all the other reviewers I know get those emails and stuff, but that doesn't mean somebody is taking them up on the offer. So anyway, so that that's a small a bit of annoyance. 
that I'm sort of half sorry I brought up, but it does come up uh, once in a while. Now, I do know that uh, there are reviewers that are paid by like some um, online game stores and also from distributors and stuff like that. And I've checked around. I don't feel comfortable. Well, one of them's obvious miniature market has some kind of sponsorship thing. I don't know that they get cash. They probably get, um, you know, like a gift credit or something. So I don't really think that's a problem because, you know, a lot of people want to do this as their job and, you know, they want to make, figure out a way to make money doing it. And, you know, I think some people, you know, whatever, you know, that's fine. If you're going to get paid by a game store or sponsored by a game store or sponsored by a distributor, then, you know, that's what you got to do. Now, if you think as a viewer that that causes a problem for you, then go for it. Now, I'm not going to get into like picking people out and calling them out for it because I'm not a big call out person. Um, not usually. <laughs> And, you know, and I don't, I don't really like to do it. If I do that, I don't like when I do that. I think a lot of times if I call somebody out like online or in a video, I think, you know, you should talk to them in person. And then if they're a jerk to you, then call them out, you know, whatever you want to do. <laughs> but uh, then, uh, yeah. So anyway, so that happens. I mean, that for sure happens. You know, you get paid, people get paid by distributors and then, uh, you know, online game stores and stuff like Game Surplus. They sponsored me for most of uh, a couple of years ago, like most of the year. And, uh, you know, and I got money for that. So I reviewed a couple of games for them. Part of the deal was, hey, tell us some games that you're interested in. And we'll send them to you. And if you like them, review them. And that's what happened. So there is that. Um, I was sponsored by Tasty Minstrel Games uh, last year for m most of the year. Now, how many games did I review from Tasty Minstrel Games? One, Yokohama. Yokohama is amazing. Um, that's all there is to that. The stipulation there was hey keep making content keep putting videos out we can throw our banner up there as long as you stay consistent we don't care what you talk about you can talk about anything you want you know um we just expect you to make content for the rest of the year and that was it that was the only stipulation i had word for word basically what they said so that's all that was and so i know a lot of other podcasts and things are sponsored uh you know stronghold game sponsors folks lots of other people sponsor uh podcasts they're not paying them to actually do a review of their game and I know some people that are sponsored by Stronghold that have given Stronghold Games a negative review, and I've given Taste Your Games a negative review. Anyway, so that part's done. Now, the other kind of relationship with the publishers thing that's interesting, uh, and this is kind of an interesting thing, is so when I started off, I never get any review copies or anything like that. Frankly, it didn't occur to me. I, I went to Gen Con one year, and I was talking to some other reviewers, and like, so, you know, you get review copies, and I'm like, oh, Oh, okay. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> They're like, what are you doing? You should be asking for review copies. I'm like, that's an amazing idea. I never thought of this. Like, who's going to give me a review copy of a game? And, you know, I just asked a couple of publishers and they're like, oh, yeah, here, you know, take it. Uh, and so, yeah, so you know, this is kind of for people if they're thinking about going into reviews and like, oh, I heard you get review copies. How does that work? Well, you ask people. I would say you do a bunch of reviews first. I mean, I've been reviewing about a year not quite a year but you know several months i've been putting reviews out and i put out quite a few i think at that time I put out like 30 or something and then i didn't really start just like asking everybody for review copies because well that's too many <laughs> um so i started asking people and they, they put them out and so i say publishers have different uh points of view on a review copy and what it means to them now some publishers will just basically send review copies to whoever asks for it and those folks have explained it to me that okay let's say i send you a review copy it costs me 25 dollars to produce the game let's say that's you know that's not what it would sell for maybe that game sells for 50 bucks in the store so i send you this car, uh, review copy and that's you know i'm losing 25 bucks but if your review sells the game to two or three people that kind of makes up for that copy and theoretically you should sell the game to maybe a hundred people or whatever you know um so th those publishers and i think that's a good chunk of them have said no i'll send a review copy to whoever you know as long as you give the game fair treatment and and, and talk about it then i'm good and it it's good now other um uh, publishers have the same attitude but they don't have enough review copies to go around because you know they print a thousand games and, you know, maybe they print up like 10 review copies. I mean, how many review copies are they supposed to print up? There are hundreds of media outlets. I mean, if you, you go across the gamut, video, written, podcasts, all that stuff. So they're just not going to have review copies for everybody. There's just no way. 
And so a lot of times I've seen some of the big publishers, um, I don't know if it's still their policy, but they will, I've had a biggest, big publisher tell me, you know what, you've you reviewed our games great in the past, no big deal, we're gonna skip you on this one. We're gonna give it to this little house over here because we like to kind of spread that around. And I kind of like that attitude as well uh, because they'll say, uh, and this is one of the biggest uh, companies you can possibly imagine. Uh, and uh, But I, they have, they've had a change of hands and people that work there, so I don't wanna give the name. Um, you know, I don't know why I feel uncomfortable doing that because it's, I don't know, it was a private email. So they said, well, we're going to skip you on this. We're not going to give you this uh, Lords of Hellas or whatever. We're going to give it to this French uh, outlet here. It's a website. And they like to do that because they want to kind of support uh, multiple reviewers. And I can name uh, Jamie Stigmar because he said that he does it publicly where he kind of like, he likes to spread it out. You know, the information is still getting out there. That content is still getting shared. It may not directly get, you know, thousands of views, but it's still going to be out there. There's going to be different voices and it's kind of raising up these different voices. And so that's something that can happen and that I've seen. And I think that's a really a, a cool kind of tack to take, uh, you know, just because, you know, you're sick of me or Tom Basil talking about your game or whoever, you know, give it to Billy and Francesca over there that are tr starting to make a name for themselves and, you know, see what they have to say about it. Now I will say sometimes and a lot recently, I get sent a lot of games that I never asked for, never heard of, and from publishers that I've never really been in contact with. That's super annoying. Not super annoying. It's like mildly annoying. Oh, what's this box? I don't know what this is. I never asked for this. I don't care about this. But put it over in the pile. I don't even know who this is. And I have asked people to not send them to me a couple of times, and they're like, oh, no, no, whatever. We'll just send it to you. I'm like, okay, whatever. I'm not going to look at it. <laughs> like, okay. Um, and so that's kind of odd. And some, the one thing that does bug me about this, though, that this kind of taints this whole thing, is it's from publishers that I've never dealt with sometimes. Not a lot, but I'm like, how did my address get out there? Now, I know that I filled out a form a long time ago. Somebody was doing a policy thing about Kickstarter re previews and who did what and whatever and what you charged or whatever. And I gave them my email address, and I did not give them my... Uh, my home address. Now, my home address is out there, obviously, because a lot of publishers don't even ask me. They're like, okay, this game's coming. and We don't need your address. We know where you live. And so somehow that address has trickled out. And that's weird. And so I'm like, dude, I never <laughs> talked to this person and I got like six games from them. I've never heard of this company and there's these games that show up. And why? Why did you, why did you send this to me? Like, you don't even watch my channel because it'll say like, there'll be like a little letter inside that says hello from the drive to the drive through review team. And I'm like, yeah, my army of, you know, employees at my, you know, like what? And I get emails like that a lot too. And, and, and frankly, those just get deleted. Cause it's like, you obviously don't, you looked me up somewhere. <laughs> uh, the other bits of it are, uh, some, some kind of interesting things about, about like playing games and being a reviewer. Uh, I, I've kind of been writing notes down this whole month. And one thing is that, um, you know, getting games to the table is an interesting thing. Uh, like I, like I never will push a game on 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 like my family or my lunch group or my game group. I'll be like, here's the games I want, you know, that I brought, and this is kind of what I want to play. And nine times, ninety nine times out of a hundred, like, yeah, cool, let's play that because they're like me, they want to try the new game, all that stuff. Sometimes they don't have interest. They're like, oh, like, oh, I thought people would be into this, but it's not, so the game doesn't get played. So that's a tricky thing. Because I think as a reviewer, you don't want to push, you, I'd never want to push a game on a group or a family member or anybody. Like if somebody want, don't want to play it, it's like, Phew, whatever, let's play something else. Let's play something we already played. I think that's something you want to be, that's something from the beginning. I was like, I will never force a game on somebody because I feel like I want to play it or I want to do a review on it. Me wanting to do a review on it doesn't make it any more important than me just wanting to play it. And so if we both want to play it and you don't want to play it, then we ain't playing it. So I think that's something you want to keep in mind. And, uh, you know, just, I would just never do that. You know, I, that's something that comes up, you know, like in the back of my head, I'm like, oh damn, I really wanted to play Rising Sun, but you know what? Too bad, we didn't get to play it today. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting thing. And then the other thing I have written down here, as I've seen uh, people say, uh, you know, I really want to play a game with you at Gen Con or whatever, or this and that. And, uh, and I'm like, usually, happy to if I have time and there happens to be a game close by I'm always like running around at conventions um but the one thing I've gotten a few times it's just it's just not often most people like are just normal like you know whatever they're like just I 
you know, I think legitimately they seem like they would have a good time playing a game with me and they feel comfortable with me because they've seen me on the YouTube and they know they, they, you know, they assume I'm not a big jerk or anything. And and it just kind of ties into my other point of like the cult of personality. And this is going to dip back into last month with the existential dread. But the whole point of this thing is, is like, reviewers are not special, like at all. We're not special people. Uh, you know, you're like, oh, I get to play a game with Joel or Tom or, or Frankie or whatever. Uh, yeah, that's cool, I guess. But like, you should want to play games with your friends. You know, um, that's the main thing. And and a lot of times you see like, you know, me playing a game in a playthrough or, or like, uh, you know, some other review group playing games together or the, the way that they talk about the game. And it just sets up a weird false expectation a lot of ways. And, and this is kind of getting back to like, I know you guys aren't dumb. I know you understand this, but it's just something that's interesting to me is like, like, oh, look at how these guys played it and how it worked and look at the fun they had and this and that. And then you get back to your group and it's like, what? This is not work for my group at all. So it's just an important thing to, to just, oh, I think always just keep present in your mind is most important. I think, you know, like I said, you're not stupid. I'm not stupid. We know groups are different. We know that the group dynamics are different. But it's just something to keep in mind when you're talking about a game and try to remind yourself. And I know for guarantee that I forget this. And I'll just revert to like, hey, this is the experience I had and this is the experience. This is the way it is. And it's not. It just is not going to be that way for for everybody. I mean, you can take this board game and ship it all over the world. And it's going to be so different. It's so, so different. And like, you just got to, you got to travel and find different people, man. Cause it, that will, I think that will make uh, your gaming and your reviewing, if you do reviewing and your life so much better. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to not tangent, but like, I'm just saying so many different people, different walks of life, different upbringings, all that stuff. That's so important to just interact with all those different kinds of people from all over this planet. So, so important to do that. Cause I think it's really going to inform uh, and re enrich your life and just make you a little bit better of a human being. I know I've seen that in myself um, coming from suburban Southern California and the idiocy that can grow out of that and the idiocy that can be like tamed and, and driven out of that too, uh, just by having a chance to move all over the country and different things. But anyway, that's a tangent, but I just think that's, that's, that's a good takeaway for doing reviews and stuff and trying to uh, set yourself apart and think about if you can i mean it's hard to because you got to take your experience and then sort of transfer it to something that you imagine that's rough but i, I just can, can't stress that enough uh, it, it'll help it'll help your, your 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 gaming grow like you know for the longest time all i did was was play euros when i when i became an adult you know um and i kind of forgot some of the ameritrash games that i liked of my kind of middle middle school teenage years and stuff and things like that you know now i've been into miniature games and just sort of the um, the depths that you can plumb in these different avenues of life and, and styles and things. Uh, just a couple other more topics here that I just wanted to cover. Um, there is the concept of like the YouTube ad. And this is a funny thing. And I see a lot of media folks kind of grousing about that. I have had literally zero complaints for running ads on my YouTube channel. Um, and that's a nice supplementary little income for spending money to buy a game or so a month or maybe some miniatures. It's not a ton of money. Um, I don't feel comfortable telling the exact amount, but it's not nothing, but it's also not like nowhere near a income. Let's just say that it's, it's like way below the poverty level if that was, you know, I would be dead. Let's just say that's how much money it is, but it's nice because, you know, I buy an extra game or buy a box of minis or something. Uh, so it's nice. I've had zero viewers ever complain to me. Why are you running YouTube ads on your channel, you big jerk? And you're making me click through this skip ad or something. Never, never once. I've seen some media folks say, well, you know, I don't think it's a good idea to have ads or whatever. And if you don't want ads on your own channel, that's, hey, good. That's fine. Um, but I would not be worried about that because I've had literally zero viewers. Now that I've said this out loud, I'm going to get a complaint. <laughs> but I've had literally zero viewers say, I'm not watching your channel because you have ads. So... Um, if you get your YouTube, you know, if you're doing YouTube and you get your subscription numbers up and all that, and you're able to unlock the partnership program, do it, screw it. You're going to get a couple of bucks a month starting off, but you know, after a while you're going to have like a money for a game and that's cool. You get like one game a month. Hey, that's fun. And I think that's, it's, I got one last point here that I see. 
it's kind of sort of like about the online media reviewer community and stuff. So if you're new to this, you kind of get wrapped up in some of these board game Facebook groups and, uh, you know, Twitter and stuff and the sort of the, the community of reviewers and things like that. Um, I would say, um, this is going to come off kind of harsh, but I would say the board game Facebook groups and stuff like that, uh, I would just stay away from those because a lot of times, I mean, it's Facebook, right? You know, Facebook kind of is toxic and crappy. Um, you know, you get these jerks posting in there like their political stuff and things and the, this and that, the one way or the other, you know, um, I think, yeah, it's just annoying as, as heck. Um, and there's, but there is some good communities out there. Uh, and I think this is one thing I want to take away is I have some lifelong friends now because of doing this. Uh, I'm not getting choked up. My, my throat just a little dry here. Um, I have to, but I do have some lifelong friends that I know I'm going to be friends with them for life uh, because of this. And I didn't expect that. I didn't expect that at all. So I think that's that's nice because we have that in common. We love games. We love, love, love games. We love, you know, putting together our little podcasts and our videos and kind of the whole creative process of that. You're going to find people like that, and that's going to be great. Um, I think the larger community and stuff of this larger, you know, like people that want to have a job and all this and do this for a living, that's all cool. And then, I mean, I... I I mean, some of my friends and this, that this is their full-time job and that's great, but I don't want, I don't think you should get sucked into that at all. Like stay away from that. Don't start from day one and be like, I want this to be a job. Don't do that because you're going to put too much pressure on yourself. I mean, it's hard work. I mean, I do this as a hobby and I try to put as much, you know, quality and stuff as I can with the time that I'm given and I enjoy it and, I, you know, I'm not complaining about it. It's just, it's just a lot of work. And if you're going to put that extra level of stress, like this is my food, you know, that is going to make going to ruin it for you. So I don't, I would say don't come into this with this whole thing and try to like have a position within the community and stuff. I see that, you know, a, quite a bit with like new folks that come out and they're like, I'm positioning to be this and that and that. And that. I mean, that's great. Like, I don't, if you're like on fire for it, go for it, man. But then, you know, I see a lot of disappointment and stuff and, and, and people complaining about, you know, their views not going up and all that. Like, man, that's, that's such a bummer. Like, just please, for the love of God, do it for fun first. Do it for like a year or two years or whatever. I mean, Tom Basil, let's take Tom Basil. He, this is his job. He's got like a little mini empire of folks and, you know, of people that he pays and works for. He did it for like 10 years for free with written and then video and all that. Now, maybe in his head, he had the long-term goal of like, I see this hobby going somewhere. And I'm sure he did. You know, I, he had this vision of it, you know, and, and, and bless him for it. And, but, you know, I don't remember him like complaining that he wasn't getting paid out, you know, in those first 10 years. So, and I think, you know, he had other jobs and he was a teacher and I think he was a pastor to church and all that stuff. You know, he had that vision. He had that, he had that fallback plan. But you got to get in this because not because you want to be on YouTube and and all this stuff, you know, or, 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 or be some media personality. I mean, God bless you for, for doing that, too. I don't want to run anybody down because they want to be a YouTube star or something. That's hey, do what you got to do in this world. But, you know, in my opinion, go after this in this gaming world, this board game, tabletop game, because you love the games. Get into it for that. Screw all the views and the thumbs up and the people patting you on the back. Get into it for that stuff. That's the most important thing that I can tell you. Okay, that's enough of me. Get on my soapbox. Um, yep, that's it. So remember, there's the giveaway. I'll put the links. And uh, <laughs> I always end these things like so abruptly. Okay, we're done. And now we're doing links. Okay, so we're doing links. All of the links in the YouTube uh, description and in the podcast thing, uh, the giveaway, the Q&A next month, for sure. Uh, ask me questions. I'm happy to do that. I think I kind of covered all that reviewer nonsense. Um, so that's hopefully that's good. Hopefully that was interesting to like 10 of you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's it. Uh, take care of yourselves. And I will talk to you next month.